wonder of the internet is that, of course, you have access to um, information that people have uploaded. And I can point to a wonderful series of segments in which somebody has um, somehow, with a lot of love, called a series of 1970s films of the composer, um, Karl Heinz Stockhausen, for example, in which at Imperial College he delivered a series of lectures about how to visualize, essentially, music scores um, in a way that was not done previously, in which texture and space could be shown. If you have the time, I think the lectures amount to probably about 10 to 15 hours of um, discussions. He shows on a, an enormous blackboard at Imperial College um, the language of data visualization, really at the most basic analog level. And all I could think about was uh, the influence of that particular series of lectures, including the work of people like, if, you, if we want to use uh, living examples, people like Brian Eno, who came out of the art school circuit. Of course, uh, Paik. Um, I can think of a few others, many others, as a matter of fact, even in the pop music circuit. For example, Herbie Hancock is still with us. Um, on this issue of how to show information and data, uh, when it comes to things that necessarily are not readily apparent to the visual sphere. I would think that probably that work would be worth a revisit. I'm sure many of you who are involved in the arts and professional spheres are already looking at it, but for maybe for a different generation, the newer generation of participants, that would be interesting material to, to mine and to be aware of. I'm going to introduce our panel one by one. I'll start with Heather. And um, then I'd like to have each one of the participants um, present a, a short deck. And um, then we can come back to our discussion, which revolves around old, current, and new tools for data visualization, for a sort of practical primer, as well as um, some of the ethical issues and real, really practical issues that revolve around uh, how to present information in an authentic way in a period in which there's a sea of misinformation. So we can get back to that. Okay, Ms. Heather Shapiro, technical evangelist for Microsoft, Microsoft Developer Group, is that correct? And uh, Heather's influence um, really extends to her work with um, the Northeast. It's in the Northeast with developers and students. I asked Heather if she was in the education business. She said, no, she's in the development business. Um, and uh, Heather has an undergraduate degree in, from Duke University with a BA in computer science and statistical science. Uh, I just wanted to note that Heather recently published uh, an article in a journal regarding MOOCs and online education. And maybe when she presents, she could tell us where we can find that article. Dr. Gaia Scagnetti, Visual and Visual Epistemology and Information Visualization Mapping. I believe you're attached with Pratt, is that correct? OK. And that you're the coordinator of one of the programs at Pratt, um, the Communications Department. You're a full-time assistant professor. You have a postdoc right, credit at the Design Lab at MIT. I think that's a notable achievement. I would imagine that, that was a pretty tough uh, bit of business to do up there. And um, in 2009, Ms. Scagnetti obtained her PhD in industrial design in the multimedia communication at Politecnico di Milano, which of course is a wonderful institution in Italy. She's a designer and researcher at the Density Design Lab. 
in Milan. Our works have been featured in conferences and exhibitions, uh, numerous, and we can mention a few, MIT Humanities Digital Conference, Seagraph, of course, Media Lab Prado. And, but the, I think the unifying theme is mapping patterns of information, visual storytelling, data visualization, and so forth. And last but not least, we have Mr. Lima, Manuel Lima, Fellow of the Royal Society of the Arts, nominated by Creativity Magazines as one of the 50 most creative and influential minds of 2009. We graduated probably from 2009 to being uh, more grave and have more substance. He's spoken at TED. I think that probably speaks for itself. I think, uh, importantly, he has a book that he has um, recently published with Princeton University. Press. Okay, he can discuss that. I think it's called uh, Visualization of Circles. Or of circles. Yeah. Book of Circles. Visualization was my interjection there. Yeah. Uh, he holds a BFA in Industrial Design and an MFA in Design Technology from Parsons. And um, I think it's interesting that he worked uh, for Siemens Corporate Research, the American Museum of the Moving Image, and Parsons Institute for Information Mapping Research Projects for GIS, a national GIS system. And hopefully he can speak to that as well. I also believe that he designs digital products. Mm -hmm. Yes? Correct. At Google. Okay. Is that an industrial design? Uh, UX. UX. Yeah. Okay. Wonderful. So now we will dim the lights, I guess, or make ourselves scarce while Heather presents. Yeah? <laughs> I think all of us are presenting a little bit, so. So I'm a, my name's Heather Shapiro. I'm a technical evangelist at Microsoft. Um, essentially what my role is, I teach students, startups, and developers in the community about uh, technology, how to use it, and our products at Microsoft. Um, so like Charles mentioned, so I have an undergrad degree in um, statistics and computer science, and and yeah, statistics and computer science, and because of that, I've always been like super interested in data science, data viz, um, and really, I never saw myself as a, an artist or a creative. Um, but when people ask me like why I like statistics, um, the main thing that I always I always mention was that like data munging is pretty creative. Um, so you have to. We'll talk about it a little bit more after, but. The people that you're trusting for this data are the people creating the data set, correct? So it's based on their biases, like based on just like how they interpret the world or data. So there's a lot of different things that there's a lot of different things that are very important with that. Um, so what I wanted to show you today was like a little bit of an intro of like if you're a developer and you need to get um, through data, uh, data science, so a lot of times I'll work with companies on how to get started. Um, they might want to do like business analytics and like what tools are available. Um, a lot of times, like I'll talk to like women who code or students who are trying to just get started in the um, data science realm. So what we're going to take a look at is uh, Azure Notebooks. Um, and so if you've never seen Azure Notebooks or worked with like Jupyter Notebooks, it's essentially a cloud version of um, Jupyter Notebooks, which allows you to code in line. And you can see um, you can see all like debug and you can write it in different. Um, you can use Python and then create visualizations like this. So the Jupyter Notebooks allows you to create slideshows. You can go through. Um, you can code in line. So we do that. That's what you get. Um, so one thing that I just wanted to show some data on of like how I've gone through and walked through a problem. So I'm pretty new to like data visualizations in general. So I kind of walk through like what are the best practices, what are the best um, platforms in Python. That's one of the programs I like to code in, and and how to like work through a data problem. So I looked at like New York City restaurant ratings. So if you haven't seen um, New York City open data. There's tons of data there that you can look at. Um, and so for me, it was really important because I like to eat a lot. And so I wanted to go through and see like, oh, like are inspection ratings really as good as they say they are um, and whatnot. So there's like 500 or I 
there were 500,000 and I looked at just uh, Manhattan and you can look at visualization, like you can look at data like this and it's really not impressive. You, it's hard to understand um, data set. You have like streets, buildings, um, what the score, what the ranking was. So in case you didn't know, um, New York City has like A, B, C rating. Uh, it used to be a number rating that was out of 108. So you might see like a 91. You're like, yeah, that's great. But then it's actually out of 108 and not 100. So it's pretty deceptive. Um, so I walk through, I'm like, okay, let's see what kind of visualizations I can create. So these are more like statistical graphs that you can create pretty easily. And this is all on GitHub also if you want to like if you wanted to check it out and, and make your own um, statistical graphs. And really the purpose will be like making your presentations better, data exploration, to tell a story. Um, and then also if you want to enhance your blogs, it's always good to have like interactive visualizations. Um, so you can do basic plots uh, about frequency. There's different libraries like Matplotlib and Pandas. Um, some are easier to code with, um, so if we see Matplotlib, there's a lot more lines. Pandas, you can do it pretty quickly without that. And you can create all different kinds of graphs, bar charts, etc. Then there's other ones that are a little bit more professional looking, and they have different themes. You can really change it to like match what, um, what you want to display, so you can look at grades by score and have um, strip plot so with Seaborn that's one option but then you can also like go deeper with the data because there's 80,000 points and now we can actually see the depth of what that data is by using a term like jitter equals true whereas before you can't tell how many points there are um, and you can go through all this go through all different types of statistical graphs that you can put in to like presentations um, but then I also wanted to look at like mapping tools. Which tools are great for mapping? Um, base map, not good for granular data. So looking at New York City restaurants and like street addresses, I had to find like upper, lower latitude, longitude corners, which is really difficult to find. Um, and then you get a map like this, and that's New York City apparently. So when you're walking through um, with which visualization tools to use with Python. There are some hindrances there and like learning curves. So base map is pretty hard learning curve. But then you can, there's also ones like Folio, where you put, all you have to say is like, here's the start, and then this is just saying the marker that I want. Um, and the really nice thing about those is that you can save them as HTML and just put them into a blog. So it saves all the data put with them and the code. So all you have to do is like copy it. And that's pretty easy. For me, this was more of an exploration of like, okay, how can I teach developers to understand their data, to present it more, more easily, and then also like tell a story through it. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Gaia. Uh, as I said, I teach and coordinate the MFA program at Pratt. Uh, today, I'm not going to really talk about what I do. Uh, I think Google is pretty good with that. You can just Google my name and find a website that I haven't really updated in the past two years, but I know you feel me on this. Uh, I want to talk a little bit more about that visualization in general and uh, raising a little bit some question around it. Uh, and kind of, I'm, I'm not going to be too academic. I want it to be very practical, but raising questions around the discipline in general and why is it such a power structure, as I call it in, in, this, um, in this title. So the reason why I want to do this uh, is because obviously, and that's very obvious to everybody, but very well said by William Davis, we are now moving from a society of fact to a society of data. And that's particularly true now. Uh, this article, it's called the age of post-truth politics, so you can understand the context. And there is a little bit of conversation around truth being, uh, the feeling that truth has been abandoned uh, and we can uh, now uh, claim fact without being factual. Uh, and so the question is what data visualization role in this and, and what's the type of question we should ask ourselves. So what is so powerful about data visualization? Why everybody wants to talk about it? Why there's a panel of, I mean, any conference has a panel on data visualization. What is so cool about it? And I'm gonna quote Sha Huang that is probably 
down there in the audience. Uh, he, called, he wrote a new hive. Uh, I'm going to give the link in the next slide. Uh, and he uh, used the metaphor of Frank's wide overview effect, that is, uh, that euphoric feeling uh, of universal connection when viewing uh, Earth from space. Uh, and he compares that to that visualization. Uh, so the question is, when we look at that, how we feel euphoric about the complexity of uh, what we're seeing. Uh, he writes, I like to think about what we do as data visualization people as a new kind of exploration, not of space, but of data. Uh, and I like to think about us as new kind of explorer and a new kind of astronaut. And I think the metaphor of space exploration is actually quite accurate because the space exploration comes with a lot of politics. Uh, the link between space exploration and uh, politics uh, in, within a country and outside. And um, you, can, you can really think about all the conversation about Russia and data and think back about the same conversation that was happening with space exploration. And this is the question that I'm going to ask today is like, what is the power structure that is behind data visualization? So when we talk about data visualization, we're talking about the visualization of that. But before the visualization, there's data science, all the algorithm, all the treatment that we do to data. And before that, there's data. So if I want to uh, open a company and want to leverage uh, the power of data, uh, what should I do? Or if I want to defend myself from the company that are trying to leverage those data, what should I do? So which are the points we should ask ourselves and really underline? So the first one is definitely ownership. So, in the data side, in the data part, who owns the data? That's uh, one of the bigger questions. Who owns your data? Uh, and if you have a lot of data, how can you sell them? And then there's production. So who produced data? So is a production um, uh, capillary? Is everyone producing data? Am I producing? Oops, sorry. Am I producing my own data? Uh, and then access. So when I have a data set, who is going to access that? If I can sell access or not access, that's obviously a leverage of power. It's a power. It gives me power uh, if I own the data or give power to access the data. And then value. How much data is our value? That's very true if you think of like Facebook. How much is worth in a click on an ad? And so how much value do, you, do, we, uh, do we address uh, or do we attach to a data point? And then when it comes to data science, here's where we treat with data we have to discuss accuracy. So the accuracy is something that is, uh, as Charles was mentioning, very important. Who, uh, how do we design systems that are, make accurate uh, treatments of data and interpretation of them? And also representation. And I don't mean representation in terms of data visualization, but who's represented within the data. If we have data set that come from one demographic, they don't, they're not representative of a larger uh, population, for example. So are we representing only uh, a certain type of uh, uh, people within our data set? And then prediction. This is like the philosopher's stone of data visualization or visualization in general. Everyone wants to use data to predict the future. And even if it was true, even if we would find that philosopher's stone, and if Google could predict uh, that I will get cancer, is Google supposed to tell me? Uh, who owns those prediction? What's the ethical connection with that? Uh, do I own that prediction or do Google own that prediction? Can they sell it back to me? And then it comes to the visualization part. That's obviously has a lot of the conversation you hear a lot in database. So the rhetoric. How do you use a rhetorical structure to tell a story? That's a storytelling. Do you tell a happy story, a sad story, an uh, uh, angry story? And then transparency, that is now a hot topic as well. When you have a visualization, do you make the data transparent or accessible to the people who are reading the visualization? Because it's easy to say, and you can see how powerful it makes you thinking or feeling when you say, oh, trust me, the data are fine. You're not seeing them, but trust me, the visualization will show you everything you need to know. It's very, it very makes you empowered, obviously, but it's, and it's an issue of power. But we are discussing, so how much transparency do we use in our visualization? And last but not least is intent. Uh, intent is obvious in any visualization. There's no neutral data visualization at all. There's an intent for our communication. We want to show a certain things rather than others. So all our kind of, all these lists are leverage point that make uh, an idea or a project powerful or sellable or successful, but also a question about ethics. 
And that's kind of my last point and my last slide. That is, so in order to um, defend ourselves or to protect our freedom and making the data visualization and this big data society not becoming like a prison in which we are just producer and consumer of data and we do just digital labor, what do we do? And I think there are three main things that come here. One is ethic, obviously, so doing uh, any of this step with ethical value. And there's a lot of projects like Responsible Data Forum and people who are discussing about the ethic of data and data visualization and data science. And then legislation that I think we're really at the beginning, but we really need to uh, go forward and put legislation through ownership of data and all this point I was making before. And then there's a community that is probably what we are all part of, that is uh, that uh, body of people who uh, keep ourselves, keep each other accountable for mistake or uh, misunderstanding or manipulation or lying or um, bad jobs and bad work that sometimes get done. Uh, so the community is a very important part of this. Thank you. <laughs> My bad. All right. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you, Isabel. Thanks you for the for the. It's great to be here with you guys today, and I'm actually going to walk you through maybe what 14 a slice of 14 years of my life in what six minutes. I'll try to do that. Um, so this is me, as as Guy was saying. You can look me up in Google for more info. But just as I'm here today, uh, my interest for data visualization really started back uh, when I was doing a Master's of Fine Arts at Parsons. And this was, again, roughly 14 years ago. Um, and uh, I went to this lecture, and this teacher of mine, Christopher Curran, was showing this understanding spectrum. And this is the kind of like the chart that got me into charts. Uh, so this is, the, again, the understanding spectrum where data leads into information. Uh, information leads into knowledge, and knowledge ultimately leads into wisdom. And even though my background was actually in industrial design, I was immensely compelled to be part of that process, specifically in creating the bridge between information and knowledge, right? This bridge between, uh, between producers and consumers. So immediately for my thesis project while I was at Parsons, I was really getting into uh, this idea, this, this notion of data visualization, which if you go back to that time, it was really novel, it was really new, it was very academic, there was not a lot of people interested even in this topic, not, that's definitely not as, as today to what Guy was saying, that every conference today you now as a, as a panel or a talk about data visualization, that was not the case uh, 15 years ago. So I started really becoming, I became a lot of interested about information diffusion, how information and, and data and knowledge traverses social uh, um, structures. Uh, and this has always been a challenge for social sciences, understanding uh, the idea, again, of, of word of mouth, right? Uh, one single idea passes through so many and infects other people. Um, so it's a really interesting sort of uh, phenomenon altogether. But then, of course, it came the internet, and it came especially the blogosphere and the blog space. And it gave us this remarkable map into how, how these sort of ideas were spreading across uh, social structures. Um, so you could really identify and pinpoint how a meme would go from person A to person B, which became my, my sort of thesis, really understanding how ideas, how memes spread across the blogosphere. Um, and in order to do this project, I really started getting into how humans have been visualizing uh, networks of influence uh, through time. So I started collecting a lot of network visualizations, uh, and not just technological network visualizations, but also from all sorts of disparate fields like biology and social sciences and, and, and so on. Uh, so these are some of the early examples I started collecting, and I started collecting many. I was a little bit obsessive about, about the whole process from collecting dozens and, and dozens and hundreds and hundreds of network visualization in what became uh, visualcomplexity.com, a fairly, I guess, in internet age, fairly old project, now 12 years, I think, uh, visual exploration on mapping complex networks. Uh, if you go there today, you have 1,000 projects. So I kind of stopped intentionally at 1,000 because it was getting too much uh, work to do for, me, for myself. Uh, but the goal has always been the same from the beginning. It was really to leverage this critical understanding of different visualization methods across a wide range of disciplines and domains of human knowledge, 
from biology to social networks or, or the World Wide Web. And that interest, that research led me to talk into you know, different venues as I'm talking to you today, which I've been very fortunate to do so. Talking to Ted uh, as well, which was, if anything, a very humbling experience and a very nerve-wracking one as well. Um, and it also ultimately led to my first book, uh, Visual Complexity, Mapping Patterns of Information. And this is really a, a large sort of taxonomical effort of, of uh, making sense of all these efforts that people were making across the world and through time of, again, visualizing, uh, visualizing networks. So these are, this is just a, the taxonomy that's surfacing on visual complexity. A few other examples here and there. I'm not going to bore you with all the details. Some of the visual, the visual models you can see more in detail. I was really getting into the sources of things. I'm a little bit obsessed about the origin of things, like who was the first person, person that got interested in, in visualizing a network. And that ultimately led to trees. And then I actually created a book on trees. Uh, it's, uh, the name tells it out everything. It's called the Book of Trees. And it also creates a taxonomy of all the sort of manifestation of the tree model, right? The tree diagram over the ages. It features 800 years of human sort of um, uh, effort in depicting trees. And here are a few examples, really historical ones from the Middle Ages, beautiful examples. I could talk about some of these for ages, just stop me outside after the talk. Um, uh, and then, of course, much more more than ones, like Voronoi tree maps, as you can see here, or even the Google News tree map, which is one of the, the sort of great projects, modern projects uh, for, for visualization. Uh, and then, of course, I, I wanted to go even further back and understand what were some of the earliest, earliest known visualization methods that we have created. And that took me to circles eventually, which I think I, I have to stop now at circles. I think there's nothing really before circles because circles go back to 30,000 years, you know, before there was language, before there was many of the things we take for granted. Uh, but then the, the circle, the book of circles really covers, again, a plethora of, of attempts at visualizing human knowledge through the circle metaphor. Uh, and it also features a, a, what I would think a pretty comprehensive taxonomy of all these efforts um, of, again, uh, visualizing uh, circles throughout millennia. This is even more widespread than, than the Book of Trees. So these are some of the, the, the projects, some of the books. I was fortunate to have a lot of great feedback from different people, different uh, newspapers and, and so on, talking about the books. And then if you are interested in my work, you can actually read them in reverse order, uh, starting from the last one. And then finally, I would like to end with this kind of, it's, it's actually something that I wrote on the Book of Trees, and hopefully we're going to be able to uh, dive into that discussion about the historical value of, of data visualization. And this is something that I mentioned, that it's too tempting for us to think about data visualization, especially now that it's in every single conference, uh, as a new thing, right? A new discipline rising to meet the demands of the 21st century. So I would like to, to actually contest that idea and, and prove to you uh, that that's not the case. It's not a new thing. We have been doing this for, for centuries and millennia even. We just have better tools and more data. So thank you so much. Wonderful. Thank you very much. I think I'd like to open the discussion up with this business of um, essentially looking at data visualization through a historical lens. Um, we have... Uh, a, really an obsessive level of interest in data visualization at the moment. And I'm just curious whether we can mine our uh, expertise here for a bit of um, maybe a sense of why there's so much urgency around this issue. And I'd, I'd like to open up with Gaia. If, if you could maybe, um, for the sake of the time that we have, which is um, maybe 15, 20 minutes, to really discuss your sort of um, impressions uh, uh, and I would like to just maybe reference a, a TEDx talk that you were a part of, um, in which you, in a sense, summarized your uh, epiphany at coming to a point in which suddenly the flood of the visual material really wasn't enough, and that you were mo maybe more interested in how data visualization could be used for greater ends. Yeah, it's... Yeah, I think during the years looking at different projects and, and observing how the discipline was changed and, and has changed has been 
yeah, it's true that there was a point in which I was like, whoa, another visualization again. Right, <laughs> sure. Yes. Another one that's going to show me something I already know. We already know. Right. There are flights who fly around the world. <laughs> right. And the hubs are bigger than smaller cities. Yes. <laughs> and, and the frustration, I think, comes from one of the classic misunderstanding or at least non-clarity about that visualization, how it can be used or it, it is used. I think there are, I, I, I say this everywhere, there are two types of visualization, that visualization. But this one type is a communicative tool. Like it's not more than less than advertising. You have an idea, you want to show a certain majority of people vote for a certain part of for a certain party, you make a map, you plot it, the thing, and you communicate your message. You have a clear intention, and that visualization is a, a medium, it show your your idea. And that that is graphic design applied to data. Right. It is nothing new. It has no heuristic or discovery pattern uh, power. It's just the old graphic design applied to sure. a data set. What do you suppose the current uh, interest in the sexiness of this particular kind of graphic design is all about? I, yeah, I think the point there is that is like because data looks and feels scientific, and in yes. actual fact, you can make something look and feel scientific just by using a certain aesthetic. That is so powerful. All of a sudden, my production looked like Scientific America, and I'm just me at home, uh, plotting how many ice cream I had this. Week. Right. It is awesome, right? Yeah. But maybe not even you. Yeah. So, and, but that's not all of it, though. There are visualizations that are usually more technical, usually much less pleasant in right. aesthetic, that are used to actually uh, discover things or trace pattern, and are usually has much less of an intent. I have maybe a non very sexy example, but like there's a lot of like period tracker who right. certain people use to. Uh, get pregnant and certain people used to not get pregnant right. so the design of it can really take a stance on right. uh, you know pro-life or not because right. you don't know how the tool is going to be used right. so those are tools that people use and then the design of them changed than, than the example we made before right. and I think a lot of the visualization we see are actually data visual like graphic design applied to data they are sexy visualization of data sets Right. Manuel, my yeah, no, I mean, you know, I, uh, I agree wholeheartedly. I mean, I think there's a huge spectrum of different types of visualization, right? Some of them, I think I always get a little bit concerned when people use, you know, the term sexy or, uh, or attractive or aesthetically. And, and I think, the, yes, I mean, it's, it's visual. So visuals are aesthetically pleasing to the eye. That's, we have been using visuals for that reason for millennia. Yeah. Again, so it's nothing new per se. Uh, and I think there's also like this debate about form versus function. And I think a lot of people tend to forget that aesthetics are critical for usability, right? So we perceive beautiful objects to be easier to use than non-beautiful objects. And even more, we are more forgiving when using beautiful objects. So beauty has a huge part in sure. usability, like in the way we actually use things. Um, so that's just my sort of like... Um, Do you suppose that it's from the fact that visualizations and the beautiful visualizations can actually be produced in a, a more, now it's more democratic, right? Where people can actually have the tools at their disposal where they can make these beautiful objects and can use data to create these kinds of things. Whereas in the past, maybe that was much more difficult. Certainly the mining of information yeah. was more difficult in the past. And, and just simply creating a, a representation of something was much more complex and difficult to do. It depends. I mean, it, it varies. I mean, again, I, I, I'm, maybe I'm just becoming, I kind of started with the, the, the present and the more I investigated the past, I became more and more obsessed with the past, yeah. which is kind of thing, uh, kind of funny how things work. But if you look at what I consider to be the sort of the origins of, of the genesis of information design, which I think it's the high middle ages in Europe, yeah. people were being inundated with new knowledge coming from ancient Rome and ancient, and ancient Greece, literally inundated. There's a lot of passages very similar to what you see today in newspapers of people, we're not going to be able to read all of this material, what are we going to do with all this data, this, the, data the idea of a data overload, right? Um, and it's interesting how people resource to, uh, to visual uh, sort of communication as a way to combat the flood, a huge flood of data, right? right? So they came up, they created all these sort of visual metaphors and some of them are increasingly complex, even for that time, even if they were not using computers. 
by hand. And they were really ingenious. I mean, they created things like the paper wheel, the Volvel, which is a right. remarkable, it's almost like similar to an, an, analog, an analog, analog computer, which is like disks of paper that overlap, and then you can combine them in different ways. And that generates, you know, sometimes millions of combinations. I mean, these are more complex than many of the, the simpler visualizations we see nowadays. So there is a tendency to think also about being influenced, which is called presentism, right? Being yeah. biased towards the present, that we are to grasp with something much bigger that has never been done before, that has never been explored before. And I always like to sort of take that with a grain of salt, specifically also because many of the visual metaphors we do today are either completely replicated from the past or just slightly tweaked. It's, many of them, it's hard. If you can actually find me a completely new metaphor that we have created in the past 10 years, I will be very happy to hear that. Well, in your sort of taxonomy of structures, right? The, the base structures that all information is represented on. So we, you yeah. may have radial and, and yeah. network structures, et cetera. Absolutely. Uh, I can't imagine that there'd be anything out yeah. there that's sure. and that far as removed from that. So. I would hope so. I mean, I think that's, in many ways, I think we need to, to do that. Right. So as a teacher, that's what I actually try to say to my, to my students is that just don't try to replicate what has been done before. Try to just break the, the mold, you know, and create. Because the challenge we're facing with all this new avalanche of data that we are, we are sort of uh, witnessing, we're going to have to create new visual metaphors to, to right. face it. Right. It's the only way out. What are the sort of practical tools you all might suggest to some of our, our participants here, uh, especially in light of new technologies or new communication methods or new ways of, for example, somebody was talking about AR, and VR, and MR, right? How do those things impact data visualization? What might some of those new tools be for the next couple of years that people should have their eye on? Um, so in terms of like focus, so like you're saying, it really depends on like what audience you're trying to reach and like where you're trying to put this data, visu these visuals. So if you're in like um, the business world, you might need business analytics, business intelligence. And now we have these drag and drop tools that you can just drag your data in and it will automatically detect what kind of uh, graph you should show and how to make it a better visualization. Um, so it makes people think that they're like, oh yeah, like I can really make this like data viz um, and make this exciting. But um, like you said, people aren't exploring like the new metaphors that you could be doing because of these tools. Um, so it does hinder, I think, people a little bit with their creativity of just having these tools. Um, and one other realm also that I've been working with recently is a, like conversational UI. So thinking about like bots as uh, more visual. So really what a bot is, is you're just looking like an AI that you've put all this data in and like how can I communicate with it? How can I visualize this data in an easier way for um, the user? And it's, um, it's a very difficult realm because some people like to see and just like click a button. Some people want to speak to it um, and other people, but most people don't like to type. So how to visualize that and make it easier and more accessible for users is uh, definitely an interesting part of like conversational UI. Would you say that it sort of interactivity is one of the frontiers that people are exploring more with data visualization in general? For sure. Like you said, with yeah. like websites like yeah. or visualizations, if the website's not good, I leave. <laughs> I, I will not keep going. <laughs> Yeah, I think interactivity. I mean, so it's kind of funny. I, the other day I was doing a, a talk and I think someone asked, you know, what kind of tools can I use to break the mold, right? Create sort of new visualization metaphors. It's like pen and paper, <laughs> just seriously. Uh, and it's kind of funny how, at least that's my view, some of the people doing that type of work right now are the people that are not so reliable on the computer, like people like Giorgio Lupi and others. They are creating all these visual metaphors because they're not so much constrained about what the limitations of that tool, the digital tool that they are using, right? So I think there's a lot of a lot there's a lot to say about those those sort of like new explorations of actually using going back to you know the pan and your yeah. brain and coming out of those and creating all these sort of new visual metaphors, even if there's an of course an implicit learning curve to many of these new sort of explorations. Right. And in terms of uh, actually presenting them or representing, what what kind of tools do you think might be the ones to keep your eye on? I think we have a little bit of the mythology of looking at like technological innovation as the future. Oh, it's because we everybody's talking about AR, so it must be the AR. Yeah. Um, but I think visualization is such an old tool. It's really difficult. Like we have been doing visualization, pen and paper, or stone and like yeah. a hammer forever. 
I think there's a lot of question about what is data now. Mm -hmm. So data as a material. Uh, even like question about should we produce certain type of data or not? Should, should, should certain type of data even exist or be produced? Not only how we protect them, but do we make them? Like, so I think there is a, now, a, now that everyone is more kind of data literal and the literacy around visualization and about data and about also the situation <coughs> of our world is you know, broader, then we are asking deeper questions that are, do we need to visualize this? Do we need to create right. this data? And I think that's kind of the future. You always get like, everybody's super exciting. And then how do we monetize this? And then, hey, do we really want to do this? Really? Right, 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 sure, sure. <laughs> store it. <laughs> <laughs> store all the data. Like, yeah. like, I'm sure. So, so if we sort of imagine that the sort of initial questions are about the vehicle, you know, what the shape, what the look of uh, data visualization might be, how it's carried, and we move to the essential questions of ethics of data itself. It, I mean, there, there's very real concern about, uh, you know, you talked about power and the ethics uh, behind power and um, how data is used. I mean, it, clearly the kind of um, sort of thematic Paul, that's over that is is really about propaganda, right? I mean, that would be the extreme example of it. So I would imagine that there's some sort of mechanisms that are being discussed in your field, that which would uh, maybe people should be aware of. You know, what would what would those some of those mechanisms be to authenticate or to keep data credible, right? Forget about the vehicle that it's shown in, because we all know that those that has propagandistic properties, right? But what, what is really being done in the field in terms of advanced research or even applied research, which goes to this? Yeah, well, I mean, I... Nothing? Even, no, <laughs> no, 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 hopefully I something is being done. Well, yeah, absolutely. So I, I think it also goes back again, like this is just me always from the past, but even this, the idea that we should be more careful about the, some of the data we collect, which is yeah. a super interesting topic right now. There's a brilliant book that I'll encourage people to buy, which is called Too Much to Know. And this is actually a, a collection of passages from the Middle Ages and far back, pertaining to this idea of being inundated with, with knowledge and information. And I can recall a lot of passages from, I think, the 1200s in Europe, saying there's a lot of junk books coming out, right? This is kind yeah. of like similar to now, nowadays. Right. A lot of junk books coming out. We should try to eliminate those books, or at least try to preserve the ones that really matter. Right. Uh, and now, can you make that distinction? So these discussions have been, again, like going on. It's just different, right. slightly different medium. Yeah. Uh, but I think even in settings like this, you always have it. This is my experience. You guys probably felt the same. There's always, like, I think, a couple of data purists in, in, a, in an audience like this that you know, normally say, you know, you guys, this is all great. All these visualizations are beautiful, whatnot. But you guys are really destroying the data. You're like really uh, jeopardizing the data. You're messing it. You, you really making it dirty, it's just you're destroying the, the, the key value of the data. Well, because there's an editorial component. Yeah, when you and of course, sure. pure data is is intelligible. I mean, no, no one can really understand what, I mean, it's just numbers, right? It's just, they don't get it. So as humans, we don't really understand pure data. It's impossible for us to make sense of pure data. So this idea that we should keep data the purest, it's just, I mean, I think, it, at least for me, it's completely relevant. Uh, but of course, I think to guys' point, there's always intent. But that intent happens in visualization as it happens in journalism and it happens in any sort of means of communication, right? So I think for us, on the other side, uh, being consumers of this, mm -hmm. I think it's just really being very suspicious of everything you read, right. being very suspicious of everything you sort of like comes into your TV set or your screen or your laptop because, and you have to ask questions like, where does this data come from? Can I have access to it? Like, so just be very you know, right. just be very uh, suspicious of everything you see these days because that's the only way you can, you know, distinguish the sort of the bad from the good. To, to wrap up, I just wanted to bring up the last point that you made about legislation. Mm -hmm. I, I'm wondering if you could just give us sort of your take on whether okay. or not there's a role for that and, and whether we should allow that to happen, essentially, mm -hmm. whether it should come from the top down. Well, I'm terribly biased because I'm European, so <laughs> I'm always for legislation. <laughs> legislation, and uh, no, but like I think, okay, in general, I think to add to to Manuel point is from the side of the designer, a good way of doing it is always design from 
your unprivileged minority standpoint. You do not design for your majority privilege uh, and safe uh, consumer. You design unless you're for in the propaganda the business. Exactly. Unless you, uh, unless you want to, of course, yeah. you are for exploiting <laughs> human beings. <laughs> yeah, in which case, sure. not that. <laughs> yeah, that's the game. But like as a designer, you have the responsibility of thinking of any type of visualization you do, or filtering system, or algorithm you're designing. What that algorithm or that system or that design have uh, uh, what's the consequences of those design right. on unprivileged and unsafe and um, marginalized no and you know, right. like no groups because yeah. I have heard a lot of conversation about that how does it matter let's just share them yeah, sure. let's open up everything nobody cares <laughs> until you are applying for a visa then the things change right. all of a sudden right or until right. you are in a persecuted minority and then all of a sudden things change so we design for that and that then yes that's a good rule because design for the ideal user Ideal privileged user, that's not right. that's so, not good yeah, idea in any so ultimately it's up to the individual author, essentially. And the yeah. community as well. Yeah. Like yeah. individual yeah. and the community. We are uh, considering and taking uh, uh, holding each other accountable. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And I think like the biggest part that we could do is like just creating more um, inclusiveness while we're creating these data sets and being more accessible because like you said, like if you're in the majority, you're not going to necessarily know how it will affect minorities. So, like, the biggest question that I've been talking to people about recently has been, like, artificial intelligence for cars, like, self-driving cars, and who creates that data? It's such a biased data set of, like, where, like, who do you choose to, like, hit or, like, which way do you go um, in an extreme case? And so, like, having people from a diverse background is going to be really important to, like, making that data pure. Terrific. Well, I thank you all for coming and uh, for the government of applause. Thank you. Uh, well, first of all, thanks for the panel and finally listening to discussion. Uh, so, uh, as your presentations made clear in many of those books, I mean, all the visualization methods have been invented, if not by 1830, even by 1860. And to me, it's very paradoxical, right? Because yes. that was the era before big data and before computers. Right, so so question, so I always ask myself, right, why we haven't invented any new visual techniques to represent information? So obvious answer, which is too easy. Well, yes, we're using the same techniques from the 19th century, but we have interactivity. But, so it allows us, right, to do more things. But somehow, I'm never completely satisfied with this answer. So does it mean that people just haven't been created with creative, that this kind of period, which happens in the early 19th century, that was it? Uh, so I wonder what your answer is. I, I, I'm sure it's a question that we're all struggling with inside, right? I, I wanted to just make one comment on, the, on the Manuel's initial presentation. That is that there's a whole aspect of this which is also stands outside of European history as well. Like we can, I was thinking about Polynesian uh, maps that have to do with um, wind, wave, and uh, nautical. Um, features in the, in the Polynesian sphere. They're very famous. They're sort of sticks tied together with a bunch of stones. They're quite beautiful and, and quite simple. What they, the amount of data that those simple frameworks contain is, is staggering and people are just discovering them. Uh, what I would say to your comment is that there are common themes of, uh, and, and really what this particular panel was charged with, common themes of narrative, right? And the structures of narrative. And I think there's a strong relationship between how data is taken in and the story that is being projected by the author, right? Whether that story is in, in sort of um, their ability to, to do things in, in, in visual um, disciplines that, that evoke, right? But essentially, you have to move the person into understanding, but you also have to move the person, the viewer or the participant, to actually engage in that piece of data. And so there's a bit of, that's why I said editorial, I mean, what I possibly would add to that is authorship is hugely important in this. And, and Yeah, yeah um, I mean, my, my thoughts on that would be, I think that's a great question. I mean, I think I've been myself debating with that problem for a long time, like trying to understand exactly why, especially when you look at this full spectrum of, of kind of repetition, 
really. If you look at the full spectrum, it's just one thing repeated after the other. And every sort of new model that we think are, is completely new has been again done. Even before the golden age of, of data visualization, which is considered to be the, even before that. Um, I wonder if there's a little bit of, of, of sort of laziness in some of us in the sense that we know that, you know, what you read the best is what you read the most. There's a sense of like, if I introduce something completely new, there's going to be a learning curve. That learning curve is not going to be worth it. It might be similar to the paradox of keyboards, right? We have come up with a much more functional and effective keyboard, but we're still using a one that's less effective because we are we fear about the learning curve that that might take. So I wonder if that's one of the, the issues there in terms of like it's almost why should I come up with a new language if people are already kind of understanding what what uh, what we have so far. I think that's really the only sort of um, possible explanation that I found uh, in terms of you know to explain to answer your question. Um, but I also think well, like um, well, education, um, so like something like this where it's Creative Tech Week, we, you don't see that very often in like undergraduate education of like combining um, artistry and creativeness with um, like the hard sciences. So and only recently did they start having like data science uh, majors. Only recently did they even have like statistics majors. Um, for undergrad, so I think like with that transformation, more it might incite people to try and be more creative with it. Um, and starting with like the younger students could be could really help that way. But I don't think right now there's like a focus on combining the two realms. I think I mean, I think it's it's definitely laziness of the community somehow, <laughs> our laziness. But I also think like to do experimentation, especially in visual, is very difficult. So you need to do research, right? And research is not really a sexy topic now. I mean, where are the research funding gone? And so a lot of, I think, the people who were doing data visualization at the golden age thought that actually if I can make money selling infographic, why do I have to spend my time trying to figure out a new, a new way of visualizing things? So we all made cute infographic with pink backgrounds and very nice font and sell it to journalism. And that was great. And then that was all, right? But then we monetized super quickly. And I say we as like the database yeah. community, we monetized very, very quickly on a new discipline and in these new skills. So then who's going to do the visualization? Who's going to try the new complex way of visualizing things? And yeah, to be honest, Guy, I think one of the, the groups are, that's doing this the best is, is density design. Yeah. I think that it's one of my favorite people, I mean, group, because you guys are really like always trying to push the boundaries of that. Because they were in a, in a in university setting, exactly. so they had this protected environment. So, they didn't have to make, like, yeah. you know, and they are Milan, so they don't have New York rent to pay at exactly. the end of the month. It's not <laughs> driven it's by easy. money, yeah, exactly. exactly. Totally, it's totally easy. correct. But I mean, I mean, just to also, like, to your point, like, I think, I'm, I'm still, as probably you are as well, I'm very excited about some of the new things that are happening in terms of, like, not just interactivity, but, like, multisensorial type of visualization, which is you can use, you know, different sensors to understand data. Uh, and all immersive ones, talk about VR, all this stuff are really impressive, right? But even, I can give you actually an example. I may, maybe I shouldn't be talking about this, but I remember like when I was, uh, I went to this friend of mine who works as a part of the VR team in, at Google, right? And uh, they were experimenting, like trying to use VR for visualizing data, right? And using visualization within a VR environment. They have this sort of like week cycles that is create a bunch of ideas. And I went there, I put my, my, my goggles on, and they had like bar charts and, and pie charts. And I was like, what the hell are you doing, man? You have this immense like space. You can explore like balloons, you know, bumping up in the air and exploding. And you can do so many crazy things. But then like, where we were like a completely new medium and we were stuck in like a pie chart. <laughs> it didn't even explore depth, you know, like dimensions. I mean, so I think maybe this new medium will like help us like try to break that mold but I, it's unfortunate i don't see that happen as often as i would um thank you so much we're, we're out of time let's um give our thanks to the panel